Our songwriters, Dick and Bob Sherman of the Walt Disney Studio. Jim, Jiminy, Jim, Jiminy, Jim, Jim, Cherie. These are the people who wrote every song that every child has grown up with. Win it up, poop, poop, win it up, poop, poop. Moments that touch your heart. He's win it up. Ooby -doo. Ooby -doo. I want to be like you. I remember the songs more than I remember the movie itself. The wonderful thing about Tigger is Tigger's a wonderful thing. Modern media, television movies, and Disneyland, they just were in the, this extraordinary position to have a gigantic impact. We were just reveling in our relationships with the studio and with Walt. When we come up with a good song idea, there were no two happier guys in the world. And we knew it. We both look at each other. Ah, yeah, we did it, yeah. We had no sibling rivalry when it came to writing. Everything in their career has pushed them into being two halves of a whole. They are, by fate and fame, shackled together. You cannot forget a Sherman Brothers song for your entire life. The biggest word you ever heard, this is how it goes. I blew it, I blew it. You'll always sound precocious, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. That was the best one. I saw this beautiful film, The Boys, um, the other night. It was something, it was a piece of art to me that came from the heart. Um, and we have the director and the producer here today. Um, you know, I was watching, I was going, chim chim in each, <laughs> super califragilistic. Yes, we are. I want to be you, you, you. I, it just, it brought back childhood memories. And it's so amazing the work and the history that is in this piece. I, if, if you haven't seen this movie, I'm, 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 I think I'm going to go to Amazon right now <laughs> after this and buy a copy just to have, I love DVDs still. Um, this man that we have today, uh, Au Pair 1, 2, and 3, The Soldier, Revenge of the Nerds 3, Turner and Hooch, uh, and of course, The Boys. Um, he is here today, Jeff Sherman, Jeffrey Sherman. Hello, hello, I'm gonna unmute you. There we go. Hey there, how are you doing? Good, I was watching you while we were watching that and you were smiling at certain moments and I was going, oh, I love this. <laughs> I love seeing reactions of someone who's so close to it and it's about family. I mean, what does family mean to you? Well, you know, family is many things. Um, to me, you know, it's obviously the, there's the genetic family, which is your, your mom and dad and your grandparents. And, and then in my case, my kids and my, my now granddaughter. Right. Uh, but I also think family is um, uh, people that are close to you. I have, I have other families that I've, I've become just as close with, friends and, and, you know, business associates. And you become a family on a TV show. I've been on several TV shows and they become a family. And, you know, it's it's uh, it really is just sort of a closeness and a, a, a shorthand between people where you just communicate and support each other, and you just there's a you know in the best of circumstances anyway that uh, you know there's a, a, a give and take where you you uh, everybody gets something out of it. Yeah, um, I did, watching this piece, and I, I I mean you've done so much work, but I, I'm just at this moment, I'm focusing on the piece because I, it just sucked me in and it made me feel like it was like, I felt like part of the family in a way. And it was so much from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, how did your father and your uncle and your grandfather affect your work? Well, I, you know, I, I was surrounded by music. My, my grandfather, Al Sherman, as we, we profile him a bit in the, in the movie he was my favorite person in the world I mean he every Saturday he would come over and and take me out fishing or flying kites which is where let's go fly a kite comes from that was a family tradition um, and then at the end of the afternoon he would take me to his apartment or come to my house and give me a piano list 
And this this is the guy, he wrote songs for everybody. He was a what they call a Tin Pan Alley songwriter, which was out of New York, all the uh, uh, the big, before it moved out to Hollywood, the, the music business was really centered in New York. And so he wrote for everybody from like, you know, Frank Sinatra and Fred Astaire and Billie Holiday and, you know, Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor, there, there's a whole generation of them. And he's one of the top 10 songwriters. And then he, he imbued that on my dad and uncle. My dad was writing, uh, he wanted to be a novelist and a poet. And my, and my uncle wanted to, to write symphonic works. And my grandfather was afraid he was gonna be taking care of them financially for the rest of his life. So he challenged them to uh, write a song that, that kids would spend their lunch money on to buy. So they did that and that led to a more than a 50 year career together working for, you know, in popular music and, and for Walt Disney and elsewhere theme parks. And they wrote, it's a small world. They wrote, you know, half the songs you hear at Disneyland they wrote. And I mean, they just became part of that. So what it meant to me was I was always surrounded by it. And it became an accessible thing for me. I, I, my grandfather started giving me lessons when I was about five. Mm. So I played and, and composed since then. Uh, you know, I've been in rock bands and I've written, when I worked on Boy Meets World, that television series for ABC, I wrote songs for that. You know, every now and then they'd go, we need a song, I'd go, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> but, um, but it was just, it was just part of, part of my growing up. So it also, it, in my own house, both my sons, I had two sons, Alex and Ryan, and Alex is 31, Ryan's 27. And Alex is a singer songwriter and Ryan is a, uh, a data engineer at, at Google, but he also is an excellent pianist, taught himself how to play, but it was sort of being surrounded by it and being immersed in it and, and, and feeling that it was something that was possible to, to do. I think that that's what, how it affected me. Uh, it's, it, 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 hearing this, it's it's it, it, it's it's great to see that film and then connect with you, and and see through the work the love and the identification that that we we have with it. Um, I, I I this was when you were coming when everybody heard that you were coming. We got the most questions through emails. Wow. So I'm going to start bringing on people to, to try to sure. get as many people uh, asking questions and then I'll jump in there too. We're going to, uh, we'll first start with Shannon and uh, Derex. There she is, Shannon Derex. Hey, Shannon. Hi, hey. Shannon. Hi. I'm, hey, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, do you like working on Boy Meets World? Oh, I had so much fun working on Boy Meets World. I was there from the very beginning. Well, not... They had done the pilot, which is the first episode of a series, and then they hired a, a, a writing staff. And it was my first time being on a television writing staff. Um, and what was wonderful about it was you get time really to live with those characters and develop them over a period of time. And as they get older, the stories change and become more mature. And it, it gave me a possibility to uh, to employ a lot of the skills that I had learned. I, I'd gone to UCLA film school and I'd learned music mixing and I'd learned, you know, how to score think music to things. And I learned how to write things and I learned how to produce things and direct things in, in sort of a little way. And Boy Meets World, I was considered my second film school or my television school because I had a wonderful boss named Michael Jacobs who allowed me to participate in all those things in editing and everything else. So that was wonderful. And the other part of it that was so great is I'm still friendly with just about everybody that worked on that show, the cast, you know, the, I, now they're, you know, a lot of them are parents, the, the little kids now have their own kids and they're older than I was when I was working on that show. So, but it was a television I, I highly recommend to all of you. It's a great, great place to work because the great the best thing is usually as you know i'm primarily a writer and when you write movies a lot i'd say nine out of ten times they don't get made and you've written you know all these i mean all these scripts behind me there are more i could show you up there i've written tons and tons of stuff that hasn't been made but when you work in television they have to have things made so you write a script and about a week later or two weeks later, it's being shot, and about a month after that, it's on television. So it's immediate and it's fun, 
and you get to live in this again it's a family the the boy meets world family is still my family ah thank you shannon that it, it, thank you shannon thank it's, you it, it's interesting too about uh, what you were saying about all the scripts behind you that don't get made mm -hmm. um how uh, i guess you have to just keep pushing on and creating more well, you know, the, tr the trick is really, and I was thinking about this in preparation for this today, yeah. you know, the thing about writing is you have to write for yourself. You have to write, what is a movie I'd like to see? What is a television show nobody's doing that I would love to do? What's my interest? What, what have I not seen? And that has to drive, you can't write for other people. You, you do that eventually, but if it has to, you're your first audience. And if you write something you love, you never feel like it's wasted time. I only wasted a little time on a few of these where they were projects where somebody, you know, gave me a little money and said, here's something. And I wasn't that interested in the idea, but I did it for the money. Yeah. When, I, when I do it for myself and for the passion of it, it's, it's always a wonderful experience. So always, if you write something you love, generally, somebody else is going to see that too. And they're going to want to, you know, get involved in it. Thank you for that. That lights a fire under me with the, the, the thoughts that I have circling in my mind. You just have to do it, you know? Yeah. Um, I have a, a, a dear friend who inspired me when I was first getting into high school and I saw him on stage mm -hmm. and I said, I want to be up there too. And uh, he's from, he's in Florida today, Mr. Matt Creek. Hello, hello. And by the way, David, thanks for having me. Hey everybody, uh, great work on coulda, woulda, shoulda. And uh, David, um, I found it. Uh, oh. Hang on, hang on, let me see if I come on I now. always have that problem. It's, there, wait, it's our, I, you can't see it because of the background thing, but there we go. Ooh. It's our high school drama um, plaque of uh, the award winners. And uh, I'm in 1979 and David's right here in 1982. Well, <laughs> I'll be sending that to you, but I found oh, it. Oh, <laughs> I love seeing that. Um, Jack, thank you so much for uh, taking my question. As you can see by the picture behind me, um, this was an album that I had when I was, I don't know, seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. And um, I played it over and over and over. And what I loved about it was, it wasn't just the songs that also had dialogue. Mm -hmm. Like, and I want to be like you, you know, it had the dialogue, um, uh, that I know by heart, you know, and I would act it out in my grandmother's living room. And then fast forward to, I don't know if it was uh, right around 2000 or so, they re-released the movie and I took my wife to see it and I'm sitting there watching the movie and I thought, I've never seen this movie. Mm -hmm. I had only acted it out in my head because <laughs> of the album that I had played over and over again. So that's, that's the power uh, of the songs from that. And I wondered if your dad and uncle had you voice Mowgli at first when they were first coming up with the songs and that. And then I have another question after that. Well, I, I, if you heard me sing, you would understand why they didn't <laughs> sing anything. My, I, my two sisters, Lori and Tracy, were both professional children's singers. I was so shy. And actually, if you ever look up, um, uh, uh, I was on two albums when dad first went to Disney. There was one called Acting Out the ABCs. It was just an LP. And there was another one where I wasn't on it. Um, I'll tell you the story about that first one. But and the second one I was on was the stories. Of, uh, what's it called? Uh, the stories of Aesop and Sterling Holloway, who voiced uh, Winnie the Pooh. is dressed as, as, as Aesop. Right. And uh, and talk. And um and I was one of the kids kneeling by him on the album cover. And all I remember was, Dad said, you have to do this. You're a Disney kid. I said, I, don't, I didn't want to do anything like this, but I did it. And they put me in this scratchy, like, potato sack that's, like, orange or something. And I just I remember just being uncomfortable. Couldn't wait for it to be over with. But the, the acting out the ABCs, I actually did sing. But I was so shy, and all the other kids were a little, like a couple years older than I was, and we all had to run around a, a microphone and sing these different kind of kids songs. And I didn't know half of them, and I was feeling bad. So Dad and Dick, my my the Sherman brothers, had written a lot of the Annette Funicello songs. Annette came down; she was a family friend, 
And she came down to the session. I knew her really well and she saw me and I got really upset and I, I ran off into the corner and Annette came over to me and she said, I used to be so shy and I didn't like to sing during these things either, but I got over it and you'll get over it. She was just a wonderful, she was like a big sister. Um, but uh, no, they did. If, if they probably would have given up the business if I was the one demoing the um, Oakley song. And my other question to you was, uh, oh, um, the merriest songs, ten feet off the ground. I listen to this album incessantly too. But that's that's not my question. Um, as a writer, when you go to pitch a piece of work that you've written, I wondered about your strategy in pitching a work and maybe the process that followed. Well, it's my least favorite part because, again, I'm shy. So I get into a room with a bunch of people that are staring at me like thinking, how do I get them to come to my side? What you do is when I've been most successful is when I'm passionate about something. I, it's a story I have to tell you. And I don't pitch the color of the person's shoes. I pitch what I love about it. So there's a thing called an elevator pitch. I don't know if you've heard that term. But an elevator pitch is like, you've got a great movie for, say you love Steven Spielberg. And you're walking into a building and Steven Spielberg holds the door for you, get in the elevator with him. You've got from the ground floor to the top floor to tell him your story idea. That's how I always start my pitches. It's like in the time of an elevator ride, which is, you know, a, a minute maybe, get that story across, get your characters, for me, stories are character driven. So I usually pitch, it's about this person or these two people and the world they're in and what happens and the challenge they're gonna face. And that, and then you get them interested you can kind of see, you know, what they're, if they're interested and if they are, then you can go a little deeper. And I always gauge the room when I pitch. I can see, you can, there, I, I call it the Katzenberg um, time. Because Katzenberg, Jeff Katzenberg, who was the head of Paramount when I first, or one of the heads of Paramount when I first met him and then went over to Disney, his foot would start wagging after about 30 seconds because he was very, he was very smart. And one time he said to me, I started pitching him this idea. He goes, Jeff, pitch me the poster. What am I going to see on the poster? Like I'm looking at your jungle book behind you. What is that? What is that that pulls you in? So it condense it down to why you're so excited about it. And I, my other side of that is don't go and pitch it if you're not excited about it. If you're, if you're excited, think of somebody telling you, I just saw this movie last night. I'll tell you this. When I was in, I was, uh, for my first two years at UC Berkeley, I was an English major. And I had a roommate who wasn't in the film business at all. And he comes home. It was finals week. He comes into our apartment. He goes, get dressed. I've got two tickets. I just saw a movie. It's called Star Wars. And I went, yeah, I heard of it. I don't, he goes, let me tell you, the movie opens and you're out in space and suddenly this enormous spaceship flies over you and there's some symphonic music playing and I got dressed so fast and we went down and saw it, you know? And that's what it is. It's get that excitement about what it is across right up front. Be excited. Don't go, don't be looking at Try and be off your pages. Don't be, if you're looking down at the paper, they don't have to look at you. Engage them, pitch them the story. That's, those are my kind of clues. Well, my, my 19 year old son, it's his passion and he just writes content and uh, it seems like the path he's going to take. So all I can do is encourage it. Yeah, just passion. It's just, if you can get that across, they're gonna know that they can, you know, that half of an interview is, you know, they wanna know if they wanna hang out with you, if they wanna work with you. So if you can be that person where they go, this guy, my uncle is great. My dad was kind of not as good at, I, I pitched with my dad and uncle. My uncle is the pitch man of the world. I mean, he's so excited. He gets the piano, he can't wait to touch the keys. And my dad was always kind of, you know, he'd sit there and he was more, you know, uh, erudite and, 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 you know, quiet. And, you know, his, his points were more to the point, but my, I had this excitement about him. And that's what I try to get across to. Well, I'd like to hang out with you. Thanks for the time. <laughs> well, we at any time. <laughs> uh, thank Let's you, see. man. Um, again, you're you're inspiring me. I uh, about twelve years ago, I started this. We just filmed this group together, and we've been trying to move it forward. And then they're stopping and starting. And sometimes yeah. I say I should just give up on it. But hearing you today really 
again, makes me feel like if it's really something that I want and believe in to keep moving forward with it. You know, I'll tell you one other little clue I have. I'm a big walker. I love to walk. You know, every morning, I just took one this morning, six mile walk. Yeah, but I also do this beach walk down in Santa Monica Beach. And it's, it's a 12 mile walk. And if you think about it, 12 miles, ah. But what I do is I always start on one of the piers that looks out to where I'm gonna go. You can see the, the Venice Pier, which is six miles away. I go both ways and it's 12 miles. And it's far away, but I just know it's, it's step after step after step and I'm gonna get there. And I take it out of my, I, you just do what you need to do right now, but always have that goal in mind. That's what I always think, I, it's always far away. It's sort of a nebulous thing and can I ever get there? And everybody goes through it. it you know, it, writer's block is partly because you're overthinking. It's I've got 99 more pages to write. But if you just write the page you're on, make that the best page it can be. Or if, you know, if you're acting and you think, how am I going to be a big star? Well, maybe I get a commercial and I, you know, and, I, and somebody discovers me on a commercial. I can't tell you how many actors I've worked with that I've seen in little student films and things like that whatever it is do the best you can with what you're doing and just keep your you know the eyes on the prize think of it's down there and if you just keep taking steps to it you'll get there thank you thank you for that um how long how long did it take you to uh to to the boys how long well, did the whole process take well i'll tell you if I, what my dad and always said people would ask them how long it took to write a song they'd say it was your entire life and the time it takes to write it down, <laughs> which is, I guess, kind of the same answer with the boys. I lived with this and this mystery of my family and the, you know, the joy of their accomplishments and the mystery of like what went wrong between my dad and uncle. And what's, you know, there's a lot of things that play in the story. And, um, but I guess physically to make it, um, it was about three and a half years of actual production and post-production. And it was uh, about a year before that, what happened was, um, if you see the movie, my dad and uncle, while they were partners for all those years, for decades and decades, 50 years, I think, or more, um, they uh, were not very close personally. So even though I grew up seven blocks away from my cousin Greg, who I made the movie with, you said I'm the filmmaker. Really, we both made it together. We couldn't have done it. I don't think he could have done it without me. And I know. And you know what I loved about that too? When I saw the the credits, when it said producer, uh, you you came first, and when it said director, he came first. So it was right. like this balance of love. Yeah, we just we we flipped a coin to see who got what. But I just said, let's not, you know. It's funny, my dad and my uncle, when they first started writing, if you see their songs before they went to Disney Studios, it was music and lyrics by Bob Sherman and Dick Sherman. My dad came first. But when they got to Disney, Disney wanted them to have their full name, so they sounded more like, you know, Richard and Robert, right? Well, Richard comes alphabetically first, and suddenly now my uncle was getting his name first. My dad never really cared about that. I think my uncle probably did, but I'm not sure. Um, I forgot what the what the beginning of the question was though. Um, oh, uh, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> no, that's yeah. No, that's great. Well, how long did it take to make? Well, yes, yes. I, I'd taken my my cousin out for his birthday, and we had tried to sell the movie as a scripted biopic, you know, with actors playing our dads. Okay. And what the problem was, nobody really put our dads. They weren't famous in that regard. Their songs were famous. Their work was famous. Their movies were famous. But they didn't really, my dad was so humble that he didn't really publicize himself. He would always say the work speaks for himself. My uncle probably would have loved to hire a publicist and, and done all that. But my dad just was, you know, just let it be. They never had an agent. I mean, all that kind of stuff. Work came to them. So um, uh, we tried to sell this as a movie, as a scripted movie with actors. And we couldn't get any traction on it because people would go, oh, well, and I said, you know what the problem is at this lunch with my cousin? I said, people, if you play a Spoonful of Sugar or you play Feed the Birds or you play It's a Small World or you play I Want to Be Like You or any of their thousand published songs yeah. that people know, um, you get it right away. It hits you on a, in a visceral way. You're, you, it, it's your childhood. It's your growing up. It's going to Disneyland. It's the records like your friend just had on the 
on the wall. Uh, if you don't hear it, it's just a song title. If you say, you know, feed the birds, that's nice. But there's something that happens when those music and lyrics play that just lifts you and, and grabs you. So Mary Poppins, the stage musical was opening on Broadway. And I said to my cousin at this lunch, I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we get a film crew with you and your dad at his hotel room? Because our dads hadn't seen each other in about five years at this point. Yeah. And I'll get one with my dad and we'll get them getting ready and we'll get them coming up the, you know, it's normally it's a red carpet, but for Mary Poppins, it was a blue carpet. Yeah. And so we'll get them and when they meet up and we'll see what happens with that. And we can interview a few of the people around the opening because yeah, Roy Disney was going to be there and some of the, you know, actors and different people that were involved in it. Um, Tom Schumacher, who is the head of Disney theatrical productions, was there. So we made about 12 appointments to have interviews and with our dads. And so we made this little presentation out of pocket um, for about, you know, for what we could do on our own. And it was about 25 minutes long and it got a buzz at the Disney studios because Roy Disney and Tom Schumacher gave it to the head of production, uh, a fellow named Dick Cook at the time. And Dick Cook called me at home and said, can you come in tomorrow with your cousin? I want to see this movie. I hear it's great. So, and then when we showed it to him, he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start it with a documentary. I, I love what you guys did with this. Let's do it as a documentary, and then we'll do a scripted biopic. Well, we've not yet done the script. We're about to, but uh, we've not yet done the scripted biopic. But that documentary got made, and, and I got to know my cousin really well and, and regained that part of my family, which was nice. Right. These stories, yeah, they... they... I've got to. I've got to bring on another. I, I'm. It's interesting. Sometimes I'm. I get out of words just taking it in. Whenever I see a movie that I just love, afterwards, I get very quiet, and I'm sort of introspective, and I'm feeling like that now too. I'm just taking it in, and I'm. I feel like I'm a part of. I'm a part of that. We're all part of each other's lives. I want to bring on. Um, Igor Zaninovich um, talking about um, part of our lives. There's Igor and and his mom is there too, right, Igor? Yes. Hi, Igor. How are you? Good. How are you? Great to talk to you. I can see your mom in the mirror. <laughs> come on, mom. You could come on in. She's right mom. here. She's right here. She's the one. Yeah. She has a story to tell you. Share with you. Oh, great. Yeah. In fact, I would like to hear, can you let me sit for a second? No problem. No problem. Sorry. There's mom. I'd like to show you a picture. Do you recognize anybody here? Oh, that's my uncle. Yeah. Oh, and wow. that's my daughter. Oh, that's when, when was that? That was a, a little bit ago. That huh? was a couple of years ago when that was that concert at Annenberg Theater. Uh huh. And it was a uh, um, dedication to songs of your dad and your uncle. Right, yeah. My, so, uncle, my uncle's still around. He's 94 years right. old. And we still have lunch every couple months. And oh, he's doing oh great. nice. He's doing great. My dad passed away in 2012, but my uncle's still around and still writing. Yes, I know quite a lot because my daughter, she went to Beverly High and uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe you even met sometimes hmm. Sandra Zaninovich and um, she, her best friend is Shoshana Klaman Scheinberg now. Uh-huh. And uh, her Shoshana's father was a doctor, Clemen. Do you, I don't know if you remember him, but he was uh, 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 he uh, was doctor of your uncle. Oh, really? Uh, uh -huh. I, didn't, I, I didn't have him, but yeah, right, we were... right. You know, oh, so no. they are they are quite uh, close. And uh, Shoshana's youngest sister, Liz Clemen, who is. Um, uh, You've heard about her. She's on Fox Business. Oh, sure. Yeah, I know. She's very good. Yeah. 
She's she went with your cousin to uh, hi Beverly. Yeah, Bell. they're they're very close. Yes. So we have many mutual friends, <laughs> and uh, I, I always enjoyed the wonderful music of your dad and your uncle. You know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, for so many years, and um, it's a pleasure meeting you. Same here. What's your first name? Ina. My name Ina. is Ina Zek. Nice. So nice to meet you. Very nice meeting you. Oh. My ex-husband, you know, maybe you heard the name Zach, because Branko Zach, he was for a while medical director of a motion picture clinic on La Brea. Oh, wow. I, I don't know him either, but that's... Yeah, yeah. but that was a long time ago, yeah. Uh -huh. oh, uh, very nice, nice talking to, meet to you. Too. And you. David, thank you for letting me talk. I, of course, of course. I know you said sent that memory in and I thought, oh, this would be fun all in the family. Yeah, it's yeah. a wonderful picture. How world is small, huh? Uh, yeah. The world is small. Thank you, Enor, uh, Ina, and thank you, Igor. Thank no you very much. Wow. Have wow. a wonderful you. day. You all too. Our thank pleasure, you. David. And, uh, and, and Mr. I, I, Sherman. I send my love to you, Mr. Sherman, and it's more than my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. And um, all the best to you, and God bless you. Have the greatest day, the greatest rest of the week ahead. And lastly, may every single last one of your hopes, dreams, wishes, wants, needs, desires happen for you. Every single last one without exception, whether they be big or small. And the same to you, too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, well, we've got a wonderful family here at Performing Arts Studio West, and I'm going to just bring on more. We have Devon Morgan here. Devon Morgan. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Sherman, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I, wait, did I tell you right? Actually, like, right? Yes. <laughs> Me, too. Oh, well, that's been yeah, yeah, because as you can tell by my background, it's Evolution Land, and I write cartoons oh, based man. on, based on, actually, actually based on what I actually go through in real life. So what I what, what happens in real life, I take what I've experienced in my real life experience, and I just make it into a cartoon, and then I, and then I, and then. I went to uh, my friend Matthew Selden's house on Saturday, and then we, 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 you know, we did voiceover work too. Oh, good. And so I tell him some of my ideas that I have, and then he he writes them himself, and then I write too, and then he sends them back, and then I tell him when can we when can we record this? When can we when can we when can we start recording this? And then he says. He says it's okay. So then we, you know, we we met up on Saturday. Then after we watched X Men Apocalypse, mm. which was which was, which was one of my favorite movies. <laughs> then um we um after that we did voiceover work, and then it was really it was really fun. What's your favorite part? Do you like the voiceover better? Do you like the writing or the what? what do, what's your um? Well, I kind of like the story. Mm -hmm. I, I like the stories that I'm actually telling. Like my most recent episode was Devon's roller coaster ride, mm -hmm. and that was based on a true story because uh -huh. I was actually scared of roller coasters, <laughs> <laughs> and so I um me too. Yeah, and, and so what I did was when I did the voiceover recording for my character, I wanted to sound just how I was when I was twelve. <laughs> When I was 12 years old, I was like, get me out of here. I, I wanted to sound just like that. <laughs> and so <laughs> it, it was really fun. It was, I feel yeah. it, it was, it's really cool. And I really, I really enjoy working with him. He's, he's amazing. Yeah, his, name, his name is Matthew Selden. I know he's not here right now. That's so much fun. That's great. So yeah. when, you, when you do animation, what's wonderful about animation is you, everything's possible. Yes. If you think about it, if you shoot live action, you have to go to the location or nowadays you could, you know, computer generate it, which is expensive and time consuming. But when yes. you do animation, you can go, you let your imagination go wherever you want it to go, which is terrific. 
and 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 there's certain kind of a, a license within a, an animated piece where you can get away with things you can express things more purely mm. because it's not you know it, it, it's it's a uh, artistic expression through the drawing and everything else too so you get to get you, your mind can just go nuts and have fun yes and now my question for you is because i heard that you also did the enchanted musical yeah how long did it took you to write that i bet that was a fantastic musical i probably haven't seen well, the Enchanted Musical Playhouse that I did was uh, one of the first Disney Channel series. I didn't do the Enchanted movie, but I, I did, saw the movie. Yeah, I, this was this was back in 1984 and five, and I sold the series. The Disney Channel had just started, and I my dad took me to a celebration they had at Walt Disney Studios for the opening of the channel. So I said to my dad, I said, "Do you know who runs the channel? Because I've got an idea for this." And he pointed to the guy and I walked over to him. I said, I'm son of the one of the, one of the, it's the only time my dad's, you know, clout really helped me out in my career. And I walked in, I said, I'm, I'm son of one of the Sherman brothers. And I've got this great idea for a series of half hour musicals based on children's fairy tales. Mm -hmm. He goes, well, that sounds interesting. Why don't you come in next week? So I went into the channel. I didn't meet with him. I met with our, whoever the creative person was. And they were listening and they were kind of interested in doing it. You know, I wanted to do like the Velveteen Rabbit and the Steadfast Tin Soldier, some of my favorite kids stories. And so they said, yeah. And I said, and I said, there'll be original musicals and I'm gonna get the Sherman brothers to write the songs. And they went, what? Cause this was like a big deal for Disney. They've been away for a while now, really. And I'd never talked business with my father. I didn't know how much he made. I, we just didn't talk about that stuff. So I had no conception. And they said, well, what's that gonna cost us at the Disney Channel to have the Sherman Brothers write songs? And I said, well, and I'm thinking, I'm gonna boost it up a little bit. I go, it's gonna be about $5,000 a song, I think. And they brought, it was like they threw a contract in front of me. I signed it, I got home and I called my father. I said, dad, we're gonna be working together. I got this, he goes, that's great. He goes, what'd you, what, how much money did you get us? I said, I got you, five, I'm kind of proud of you, $5,000 a song. And there was this long pause. And my dad said, back in 1951, I think, Dick and I got $5,000 for a song. I was like way under what they normally got paid. But, you know, it was sort of on a budget and cable was kind of new at that point, original cable programming. So it actually was about the right amount. But um, it was wonderful. I got to work with my dad and uncle. There's that one picture I saw you were posting where I'm there. We did the show with, you know, I don't know if you know the Osmond family, Jimmy and Marie and Donnie yeah. and all those. So I worked with Jimmy, Marie and Donnie and Jay mostly um, out in Provo, Utah, at their studio. Uh, we were partners, producing partners. And I got to um, got very friendly with them and spent a lot of time in Provo, Utah. Um, and again, that was another education for me because now it was an all inclusive studio. They had a recording studio there. They had dance rehearsal studio. They had shooting areas, they had costume department and makeup. It was a little studio all in this beautiful little place and nestled in the, in the, in the uh, mountains and the snow. And so I got to just do all that again and work with the Osmonds. I was in recording sessions with Donnie and Jimmy. And it was like, again, just the wonderful thing about writing and, and anything you do in the business is it's a ticket. You buy your own ticket. It's your ticket to go places and do things and meet people that you never normally would have. I've, my adventure in, in doing all this, like when I did The Boys, we did 88 interviews all over the world. I sat with Julie Andrews. I sat with Dick Van Dyke and John Williams. And Kenny Loggins handed me his guitar, you know, uh, all this, you know, and I'm, we're talking, Angela Lansbury and, uh, uh, you know, 88 interviews, so you can imagine. We didn't even use all the, we couldn't use all the interviews in it, but we were just like, who else can we get, you know? <laughs> so um, it's, when you do it, you, you, you get this ticket to go places and do things and, and your mind, when you're doing these animated things, you can go anywhere you want. You can you can work out the problems in your life. You can you can explain to people, communicate to people, connect to people, and that's the the joy of it all. It's it's a wonderful thing to do. So keep doing it, everybody. And my and my, and my other question is: I know you wrote Boy Meets World. Um, have you ever wrote 
for a sequel? Because I had a sequel on Disney Channel called Girl Meets World. Have you ever been any episodes for that? Well, they, I was considered for that show, but I was too busy at the time to get on. They did that, that series. And it was funny because I was on Boy Meets World for the first four and a half years of the show. And I ran out of kid stories. I'd like done all, I was going to my friends going, what happened to you as a kid? Like I was trying to borrow other people's stories because I'd done all, like, just like you, I put my life into those. I was, at times I was Corey Matthews. At times I was Sean Hunter. At times I was Eric Matthews. I was the parents. I was, you know, and I, I'd been all those different people in, in a situation. And again, you know, when you pitch the story in that room, you go, there was a time where, you know, my friend broke up with his girlfriend and we all didn't like her. So we, you know, I, I said, you know, boy, I'm so glad you're not with her anywhere because we couldn't stand her. And suddenly he said, she's right behind you right now. And so I pitched that in the room and that became an episode that we did, you know. So that's what it's, it, it's wonderful to bring your life in. Everybody's got, the, there's the, the two guys, two of the guys I work with on Boy Meets World right there. There's uh, Will Friedel and, and uh, Ryder Strong who played Eric and, 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 uh, and Sean. Um, we're still friends. I'm going to, they do a podcast, by the way. I don't know if you, if you're, if it's on your radar, but if you like Boy Meets World, uh, the three of the kids from the show, those two guys and Danielle, who played Topanga, have this, have this new podcast called Pod Meets World. And they haven't watched the episodes since they were little kids. So they've gone back, they watch them and then talk about them and they bring on guests and I'm going to be a guest in October. Oh, so, that's great. Yeah, it'll be fun. That's fabulous. Thank you, Devon. Thank you, Devon. Nice to meet you. And keep it up. It looks great. I love the I love the characters. Um, I you know I was thinking about the music in the films and how we all have our favorite songs. Like I, from from your film, you said Walt Disney, his favorite song was "Feed the Birds," and yes. then your father had his favorite song. Do you have a favorite song? I have a few. It's funny because I asked that a lot and my cousin and I were, we did a whole press jump when the boys came out, when the documentary came out and Greg and I had a little game we would play. We'd always say a different song because, you know, I love all their songs anyway, just about. Yeah. And, uh, but two of them have a special place for me. One is Spoonful of Sugar and the, and the reason being it's in the movie a little bit, but when I was a kid, um, polio was a big deal and it was, it was around like COVID is now. And so at school, um, they lined us up and they gave you the uh, polio vaccine. And so, you know, and it, and it stopped it from spreading. Yeah. So one day I came home from school and my dad and uncle had written a song, all the songs from Mary Poppins and they championed Julie Andrews being uh, Mary Poppins. And she'd come out, listen to all the songs. Their favorite song that they'd written was a song called Through the Eyes of Love. Now you guys have never heard of that song because what happened was they played all the songs. Julie listened, she loved everything except that song. She said it was okay, but it wasn't really, didn't feel like the rest of them. And they were really disappointed because they'd gotten her, you know, really told Walt, get this woman, she's great. And she didn't like their favorite song. So my dad and uncle were depressed. They went back to their office and they were trying to think of another song to write. And, and, and so they were trying things like a stitch in time saves nine and everything was falling flat. So dad came home early that day and I got home from school and my dad said, how was your day? And I said, well, I had the, uh, the polio vaccine at school today and I was notorious for when we were kids, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to bring this tray with all these different hypodermics and you get your different measles shot and your this shot and all these booster shots. And I hated it so much that I would, the nurse would be holding the tray. I, I'd knock the tray and I'd run and hide. But <laughs> so my dad couldn't believe that I had let somebody, he said, you let somebody give you a shot at school. I said, no. I said, what they did was, they had this little plastic spoon, they put a sugar cube in it, they put the medicine in it, and you just ate it. And I saw my dad go. And he walked over to his phone, called my uncle, they went back to the office and wrote, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So I really didn't, I just told him what happened to me at school. The genius was that my dad and uncle took that and wove it into that song that we all know. The other song that's a, a 
one of my favorite songs because, well, they did a movie called Tom Sawyer. And at the time I was in high school, I was, a, I think I was a sophomore in high school. And I uh, met the producer of this fellow named Arthur Jacobs, who, if you ever seen the Planet of the Apes movies, all the original, he, he produced all those. Yeah. and a lot of other stuff and just a really nice guy and I was at a party at his house and in his backyard he had one of the that statue the famous statue from Planet of the Apes and I said you did that he said what you like movies I said yeah he goes well you know we're doing Tom Sawyer and you're going to Beverly Hills High School right behind there was 20th Century Fox Studio it was a bike a short bike ride away from there he said any day you want to come we're doing all the post-production there there's editing and there's we're you know scoring the, the the soundtrack John Williams was the conductor arranger of the score it was the last one he did that before he did like Jaws so he was you know, 120 piece orchestra in the big sound stage at Fox so every day after school I would ride my bike down there and and, and go down and, and watch them score the movie and sit through dailies, which is, if you don't know what dailies are, it's every every day when they shoot, they were shooting in Missouri and they would shoot send the film out. Every day they would have for the people in Los Angeles, a screening of whatever they shot that day. Those are called dailies or rushes. So I would be able to, I, I got to go to those every day. I saw everything. So I'd go down there and one day my dad said, look, Jeff, I want you to take off early from school today and come down to the, the recording session. So I did. And I got down there and they were recording the main titles of Tom Sawyer, which is, you know, sort of a medley of all the songs. And it culminates in what is kind of the title song, which is called River Song. And River Song is a song about Tom Sawyer, about a boy growing to a man. At the time, I was interested in going to a prep school back east, and I, and I was applying to prep schools when I was going to move away. I'd gotten into three back east, and my dad was a little, I guess, sentimental about it. And uh, he, uh, that day, when I got to the soundstage that recorded this, and then the, the uh, I, I still didn't really know what was going on. Arthur Jacobs came in, and he had a box, and he opened it up because I just got the new with the logo on it for Tom Sawyer. And he said, what size are you? And I said, I'm a large. And he handed me one. So I got to put on the first Tom Sawyer shirt and I'm sitting there and there. So anyway, at lunchtime, the orchestra takes a break. And um, this fellow walks in the back of the soundstage and it's this famous singer named Charlie Pride. Mm -hmm. Charlie was a, a huge, he just passed away about two years ago. He was a huge country Western country singer. Um, and so he came in and he was going to sing River Song. So they set it up for him and he sang the song, I think twice. And they used the first take because it was so beautiful. And he sang along with the film being projected. It was really emotional. And then there was a studio photographer there on the sounds on the recording stage. And my dad said, hey, Charlie, can you come take a picture with me and my son? So I'm there in my, uh, my Tom Sawyer shirt. And there's my dad and Tom Charlie Pride. And we take the picture. And my dad leans over to me and said, I wrote that song for you. So that's, cool. that's, that's probably my other favorite. And I love Feed the Birds and I love Mother Earth and Father Time from Charlotte. So there's a lot of them. They're beautiful songs. <laughs> anyway, I'll get all the clamped. That's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. Um, I want to, I'm going to bring on Julie Johnson. Uh, I know she wanted to ask a question. These stories are just wonderful. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have a question for you. What the most important lesson was given from, from your father, Robert Sheldon, or what did she? What was my favorite thing that he told me? What was the most important? Lesson. Lesson. Oh, so many. Uh, he, he was, you know, I, I learned through, a, I learned a lot of the lessons the same way you would is through his songs. You know, to my dad, the songs were messages. Um, but I think what, I, I, what always pops in my mind, because people have asked me this, I used to write sort of sadder pieces and, 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 you know, dark things. And my dad, who was a little known thing about my dad before we came out with the movie was my dad was a soldier in World War II. 
and when the and fought the Nazis over in Europe. And he was the first American soldier and went into one of the concentration camps and saw the darkest, horrible things in the world. So when he came back, he only wanted to bring happiness to people. He didn't want to make people wallow in sadness. And my grandfather was the same. My, my grandfather wrote his biggest songs during the Great Depression, you know, when the stock market crashed and all that. He wrote optimistic songs like potatoes are cheaper, tomatoes are cheaper, now's the time to fall in love, you know and won awards for those uplifting things. So I, he would, I, when I'd show my dad some script where it was like a horror movie or a, you know, some sad tragedy, he goes, there's enough of that in the world, you know, uplift people. So I think that's really the lesson that I got from him and my grandfather, you know, just lift people up with what you do. That's probably the biggest lesson. I got one more question. Sure. If you can go back in time, what DC movies that you see yourself dancing and singing the one of your father's songs? Which song would I want to go back in time and sing? Uh, um, it, um, what DC movies that you see yourself dancing and singing one of your father's songs? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's funny. Uh, the, when they were making Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, have you ever seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang with the flying car? Yeah. So do you remember when they go under the castle and there are all those kids hiding because the, the queen doesn't like children, so they have to hide almost like rats under the castle, right? So we traveled out to England and Cubby Broccoli, who was the producer of the movie, he did all the James Bond movies. I mean, we got... I you know, it's fascinating to see that because I always thought it was a Disney film, but then but, to, to see that. Well, you know, the, the way that happened, just to sidetrack for a minute, Ian Fleming, who wrote all the James Bond movies, wrote one book for his son, which was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So, so Cubby had bought all the Ian, Ian Fleming stories. So he wanted to make that one for his own children, for Barbara and, and Michael and, and the kids there. So you know, and he brought on my dad and uncle, but it was right around the same time and everybody thought it was, was that. Anyway, so we went out to visit dad. Dad was working in England, in London at, at Pinewood Studios. And so we flew out and we spent a month in England, in London. And Cubby said to me, he said, how would you like a little part in the movie? And I'm like, uh, okay, do I have to have an English accent? He goes, we'll work on that. You know? <laughs> so, um, and so I, if you remember, when they go under the castle, there's a little boy who goes to Dick Van Dyke to, to crack his pots and says, sir, are you here to save us? And I was supposed to be that little boy. Yeah. So I practiced it. I, I mean, I'm, I'm so nervous and shy. And I told you, I don't <laughs> like doing that stuff, but I, I wanted to be in this. And this sounded so cool, right? I just was hoping they didn't put me in another like potato sack. But um, <laughs> no, so uh, anyway, so I got it all ready. Sir, have you come here to save us? You know, I was all ready to do it. I was going to do it. And it got delayed and we, I had to go back to school. So I didn't get to play the part. Oh. <laughs> but I think that's the one thing I probably would have loved. I would love that moment. Although I'm sure I would have been self-conscious seeing myself up there. Well, but um, how actors are. the whole time I was on Boy Meets World, they kept trying to, a lot of the writers did little, you know, guest little parts and stuff. They kept trying to get me to do it. And I never, I never did it. I just, it's not, I, I'm not big on being on camera. I love it. Thank you, Zuli. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, you were talking about like things that I didn't know. I didn't know about that. Cubby Broccoli did that. And then when I saw it, oh my God, because I was a big, huge fan of James Bond as well as Disney. And then the other thing I didn't know uh, that that your, your dad wrote Kenny Loggins, that Kenny Loggins song. It yeah. was like, and I love that song. It's gorgeous. Oh, yeah. yeah, they. Uh, it was it was fun. I was a big Loggins and Messina fan when I was in high school. I went to, I had a friend, Ann Goldstein, who was an artist, and she used to draw him all the time. She loved Kenny, Kenny Loggins. So, um, and I just, you know, the, their music's beautiful. So we got, the thing when we, when we asked everybody to do this, there was only really one person who said he wouldn't go on camera, which was Ringo Starr. 
He did for whatever reason he didn't want to, he didn't like to do interviews and stuff, so he didn't want to do it. But everybody else, I mean, we asked, we did 88 interviews, but we asked a lot more people. We just kind of had enough and we we didn't need more. Yeah. Um, to put but, it on the DVD extras, right? Yeah, there are if you get the DVD. There's an hour of extras, and a lot of them that you don't see in the movie are in, in the DVD extras. And the extras, I have to say, my cousin arranged that. He, he, he said, we got so much good footage, we should really do. And he talked to uh, Bob Iger, who was the head of the chairman of Disney. Right. And so we have all these great extras. Can we have a little more money to do that? So they, they gave us another few weeks in an editing room, and uh, we, we got to do a whole section about the theme parks and about how their work process. And if, anybody who's interested in writing songs, there's a lot of really interesting things in there. And we show my dad, my dad was also a painter. We show my dad's paintings, a lot of them. And so there's there's some some really fun stuff in there and, and interviews that we didn't include in the... Uh... Well, I know what I'm doing after this interview. I'm going <laughs> to Amazon and buy it. Yeah. Um, I know we, we have about 10 more minutes left and I know we have several questions. So I'm gonna try to get everybody in. Sure. Try, try to get it. Let's do T-Bone, T-Bone. Hey T-Bone. Hello, how you doing? Fine, how are you? Um, I have I have a couple of questions for you. Great. Um, when, when you were doing ooh, 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 do you do you ever did you did you did you ever did you did your family always support you when you were doing when when you when you when you were when you were doing it did your family always support you when when you were when you when you were when you when you were away, I'm not sure I understand. Did, uh, mm -hmm. The first part was uh, oomph oomph oomph. I want to be you, right? But uh, yeah. and also, did your family always support you? Oh, you know, I yes. My my family was wonderful because both my parents were artistic. My mom, even though she she was what you would in the day would have called a a homemaker or a housewife, you know, that, that was her, that, you know, she was an artist and she painted and she did metal, uh, I mean, uh, clay sculptures and they were all over the house. Everything she did was very artistic. She designed the house, she designed paneling. So they were both, you know, completely supportive. And they, um, I remember I was in film school and I was writing my first screenplay mm -hmm. on my dad's typewriter in, my old bedroom i remember he'd taken it over to his office and i was typing away and i had to get it in for my class i was writing my first feature script it's up there somewhere mm. and I, I suddenly i noticed my dad was standing in the doorway and i said oh i didn't know you were there i said he said i've been here a while i said what are you doing i was watching you work and he said you really love this don't you i said yeah he said, I'll support you in this as long as you need me to. I, I, you, you should do what your passion tells you to do. So he was always wonderful with that. If I, whatever I wanted to do, it didn't have to just be in show business. He was a little nervous because his career, even though he's a huge songwriter, it's a roller coaster, not to scare, you know, anybody uh, <laughs> with the roller coaster. <laughs> but, um, but it, it, you know, it's, it's a tough career because it's not always it's feast and famine and you but you have to, again if you have to, I have to be a writer I have to write music I have to do these things because it's just what I do so if you do that you know just keep going with the keep the, with the passion and, and, and do it because even if it, it only turns out that you create it for yourself you've created it you've expressed it and people will find it you know that's that's what I found in my life Thank you. Thank you, uh, T-Bone. Thank, Thank you, T-Bone. Um, uh, I think we'll have time for two more questions, and then I, I have a, a final wrap-up, too. Let's see. Oh, I know. I just saw her. I want to I get so many people in on here. Let's see. Let Ron Johnny. Ron Johnny yes. Reyes. Hey. Hello. How are you? Uh, really good. Okay, I guess I have a question right sure. here. 
How do you make a boy meets world? How long do you compose musically? How do I, um, what was the last part? How do I what? Okay. Then how do you make boy meets world? How long have you composed musically? How did you make the Boy Meets World theme song? Yeah. Oh, okay. How long have you composed musically? Okay, I didn't write the theme song, or, and they had different ones, different seasons for various reasons. But um, what I would do is we would do an episode. I, I did one episode, for instance, called Shallow Boy. And there's a girl and she's singing these really sweet songs. And Eric, the older brother, so I, I wrote those sweet songs with the girl, the actress that was uh, the, that was in the in the show, Leisha Haley, who went on to do the L Word and a bunch of other shows. Um, but she and I sat down and we wrote some really horrible, like sweet songs about you know this and that. And then what happens is Eric, the brother, can't stand her after a while because it's just too sweet. And when he breaks up with her, she writes really good songs. We did that based on Alanis Morissette, who wrote her first album about an ex-boyfriend. That was what I pitched. What if he fall in love with a girl? And then he like you know he breaks up with her, and so then we wrote these songs like "Shallow," and she's like really angry. <laughs> big famous radio star. So that you know, it's just kind of what I learned from my dad is my dad you know his they they'd written popular songs before they got to disney but they were just writing songs for singing artists like you know johnny burnett and different people and doris day and and they they had a few hits but when they got to work for disney the songs became narrative songs in other words they were part of the story so the song the song is almost a scene in itself the song has a reason to be there so it's an easier process because you're just you're bridging, you know, if you're looking at Mary Poppins and, you know, oh, yeah. they, they, they have to, uh, Mary Poppins wants to explain to them what Tuppence is all about and what it can, what it can mean. And so that song Feed the Birds really is about charity, about taking care of people around you, you know, and. So it, it's not just, I love you, or, you know, I, I have a fast car that's, you know, a pretty car or something. There's, you're telling a story in those songs. So that's a wonderful way um, to, you know, it almost like it take, they used to get scripts, a finished script that didn't have songs in it. And they'd look and go, well, this scene should be a song. And the writers would get upset with them because they, they love their scene. Mm -hmm. But they go, no, suddenly that song becomes Feed the Birds or whatever that song's going to be. And the last one is, who inspired you on being in the Zooming Brothers film? And who inspired me? Who inspired you on the during the um documentary movie on Zooming Zooming Brothers film? The Sherman Brothers. Well, what I I wanted to. My dad and uncle again. They weren't people didn't know they weren't like household names certain households if you were into musicals you would know the sherman brothers but like you know you know you've probably heard of you know who, uh, whoever's writing a uh, uh, elton john or whoever's oh, yeah. writing those you know you've heard of them but my dad my I, I think it was mostly my dad's fault he just was so humble he didn't really want to make it about them he wanted it to be about the work yeah. so i felt i saw my dad was getting older you know he was he was living in england and kind of away from all of it. And, and I wanted him to understand what he'd done for the world. And so my cousin wanted to do that for my uncle. And I also kind of wanted to get to the bottom of this family rift and understand it, um, understand why everybody was so upset with everybody. So um, it was really kind of to connect my father with his legacy. So people would go, oh, this, you know, spoonful of sugar or, um, you know, the, the, whatever that song is, those two guys wrote it. In fact, some of the people I, I asked to be, to be in the movie, they couldn't believe that people, two guys had written all these different things because you didn't know, you know, yeah. you didn't know they, it was all by these two guys sitting in a room together. It was amazing to hear too, some of the songs that were sung by the rock artists, the pop artists during the mm -hmm. day, I didn't know that they wrote some of those. Yes, they, it, they, 
you know, they've been, they've worked with just everybody. I mean, it was the, the hardest thing about the boys was cutting, you know, you have a thousand songs, 50 movies, all these different things. And it was just like, yeah, get it down to the salient things. And what I finally figured out one day, we were having trouble a little bit structuring it because we had sequences. We had like their early career, their relationship as boys, their relationship as men. We had different kind of categories. And we had this wall of cards with these different scenes on it. And suddenly I was looking at it one day and it was like a moment in the Da Vinci Code where you go, oh. and I went, let's get together. The first song, they, the big song they wrote for the Disney studios, it's too, it's too, if you ever saw the parent, the original parent trap, it's that song, let's get together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's about two sisters who were twin sisters who didn't know each other. Oh yeah, the circumstances <laughs> of, the, of the movie they get together and they and it, the, the songs are let's get to, the words are let's get together and it, it's them getting together to be songwriters for Walt Disney. The last song they ever wrote together was for the stage musical of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and it was called Teamwork, which we end the movie with um, our documentary. And the lyrics are, "Teamwork can make the dream work if you're not afraid to fight." So I realized at that moment looking at the way the songs were laid out, they were writing about their themselves, their, what was going on in the world and what was going on between them. So if you track that, that was the spine of our documentary, yeah. was their relationship. They were telling you their story through their songs that we all know. And you put it together and now you've mapped out who the Sherman brothers were and how they felt about each other and how they felt about the world. Beautiful. Thank you, Ron Johnny. Thank you. Um, I know we're coming down to the end. I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to throw out a name um, and see what first comes to your mind. Uh-oh. <laughs> Wendy Liebman. Well, that's uh, my favorite comedian. Wendy Liebman oh, yeah. is a, a terrific comedian. She's a beautiful woman, and I'm very happy to say she's my wife. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Wendy and I met. I was I was um, sent in by my agent to. She had a deal with Columbia TriStar to do a a. a uh, she was voted comedian of the female comedian of the year, and she got a deal at Columbia TriStar to do a television series based on her material. And for your friend that uh, that came on, who's the animator, it was going to be an animated show. So I was one of five or six writers they were talking to. And I got the job. And so again, not all projects, as I said, end up being made. That one didn't get end up getting made, but I got the girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I tell you, she is just a joy. I mean, we did an interview, I think it was a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And I just, she is so funny and she is so loving. And I could so see the two of you together and one day, yeah. I hopefully will see the two of you together. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this again with you both together if you ever want. So. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, so, but she's uh, she's just terrific, creative, and also musical. What people don't know is Wendy was the star of her high school musical. She was Eliza Doolittle. She was, she did all those. So, and she plays piano and she writes. So it's, my house was, you know, my two sons. My uncle would come over. I have the piano in my house that was my grandfather's piano that I learned on. And then when he passed away, it was in my my dad and uncle's office for years and they wrote scores on it. So now it resides in my house. It's my favorite possession of all my uh, my stuff. Unfortunately, if there's ever a fire, I can't move the baby grand piano, but right. uh, <laughs> I would try. What do you want the most at this moment in your life? Career-wise, person, personally, or what? Either, or, or both. Well, I'd love to see the world calm down a little bit. I'll be honest. Um, I'd love to, and, and it's something we can all do as artists, which is we can, we can instruct and, and um, you know, help people understand things. The way, same way my dad and uncle did, same way my grandfather did. I've done it to a degree in my thing, in my own way, on Boy Meets World, my stories, I tried not to be preachy with them, but the first year I did a story about running away from home because they were little kids, the fugitive. And the second year I did one about standing up for your friends. And the third one, I did one about school vandalism 
and standing up against it. And the last one I wrote was um, about um, child abuse, um, which is hard to do on a, on a kid's sitcom at 30 or whatever time we were on at that time. But you can, you can tell stories in a subtle way. You can, you can help the world become more understanding. You know, my dad writing, it's a small world. It's, the, it's considered the world anthem. It's the most performed song ever. And if you listen to the lyrics of that song, you know, it's about we're all different and we all have different customs and all that, but we need each other. Yeah. So that's, I think, what I want the most is to, to create, still create things that, that give that understanding and not in a syrupy way, but in a way that people kind of can embrace. I mean, what the, the biggest joy I get, I think, personally, aside from, you know, things about my dad and, and, the, and the love that's expressed, is people tell me that they they grew up on Boy Meets World and and learn things, you know. So that's that's a big joy for me. Love and healing. Love yes. And healing. River runs warm in the summer sun. River runs cold when the summer's done. But a boy's just a dreamer by the riverside. All the water's too fast and the water's too wide Then the world turns around and the boy grows tall He hears the song of the river cold The river song sings, travel on, travel on You blink away a tear and the boy is Oh, rivers gonna flow across the land, across the land. Oh, rivers gonna flow to the sea, and the boy is gonna grow to a man. In his life is a free. Oh.